Olá, boa tarde, estamos ao vivo. Boa tarde a todos. Bem-vindos a... 11º Seminário Nacional sobre Geografia e Fenomenologia. É, nessa abertura, eu quero destacar a excepcionalidade que envolveu a organização e a realização desse evento. É, não vou começar falando, não vou falar da, da Covid-19 né, e das mudanças que ela nos impôs em nossos mundos e em nossos lugares, pois cada um sabe bem né, como fomos afetados na nossa carnalidade e na nossa geograficidade. O fato é que se deixamos Niterói em 26 de setembro de 2019, com perspectiva de realizar um evento presencial em Teresina, organizado por nossos colegas do grupo da Universidade Federal do Piauí, né, é, num momento, né, décimo evento, de maturidade e, ao mesmo tempo, de renovação do Grupo de Pesquisa de Geografia e Humanidade Cultural, que promove esse evento. É... Fomos, em maior ou menor grau, confinados e afastados da presença dos outros. Mas considero que esse seminário se inicia né? é... a partir de nossa situação enquanto seres no mundo que na ausência né, é, do contato direto se fortaleceu enquanto coletivo, que inúmeros, de inúmeros lugares né, em que nos encontramos, né, ainda que virtualmente, e que viabilizou esse evento que ora se inicia. Né? É um evento, nosso primeiro evento assim, é, em que a localização é uma localização difusa. Né? Nós não, temos, não tivemos uma organização. Né? E eu eu acho que isso fortaleceu o coletivo também né, em é, colaborar nessa organização. Não posso deixar de é, mencionar né, que essa falta de contato presencial foi potencializada pela perda de nossa querida professora geógrafa Lívia de Oliveira, né, é, se o grupo, por mais de 10 anos, foi levado por suas mãos, mãos experientes nessa trajetória pelos campos da geografia humanista, cultural, agora seguia pelas palavras que nos deixou em seus escritos. Passo a palavra para Eduardo, que vai é, encerrar essa apresentação. Bom, boa tarde. Eu quero... Obrigado, Werther, é, pelas palavras e quero dar boas-vindas também, né, a todos que estão nos assistindo, e, e agradecer o esforço, né, de, de todo o grupo aí que se engajou na organização desse evento, como o Werther destacou, um evento diferente, né, de outros, e tanto daqueles que pensaram e propuseram atividades, né, pensar nos nomes, nas temáticas das mesas redondas, das conferências, quanto aqueles que se dedicaram aí à organização do site, da programação visual, dos arranjos para essa transmissão e tantas outras atividades fundamentais para a gente ter esses, essas quatro atividades, né, ou quatro períodos de atividades, hoje, dia 23, e amanhã, dia 24. É... E sobre, o Vete disse que não ia falar do, da Covid, a única coisa que eu tenho a dizer é que, mesmo depois de todos esses meses, eu me recuso a dizer que nós estamos acostumados a um evento assim, né? Não estou acostumado e não pretendo me acostumar a esse tipo de atividade, né? Já que prezamos tanto os encontros e as possibilidades da, dos diálogos para além desses momentos, né? É, esse, esse ano, mas dentro desse contexto, né, esse ano nós pensamos um evento mais focado, é, ou talvez mais enxuto, né, nós abdicamos de fazer uma chamada de trabalhos, por exemplo, e organizamos a programação em torno de duas conferências internacionais, duas mesas redondas, e a nossa tradicional, já tradicional, mostra de artes, né que já temos feito há alguns anos e a cada nova edição 
ela se mostra mais consolidada. Né? Esse ano a Mostra de Artes está acontecendo também no formato virtual, no site próprio, e vai ter, inclusive, o seu lançamento logo após a conferência de abertura nessa mesma transmissão que nós estamos agora. Mas, comentando a, rapidamente a nossa programação, nós teremos, né, a, agora para abrir os, os nossos trabalhos, a conferência de abertura com o professor Dylan Trigg, que é da Áustria, e essa conferência vai ser moderada né, pelo, pelo professor Antônio Bernardes, da UF, e também pelo Felipe Aguiar, também da UF. E teremos a, o prazer de ter também na conferência de encerramento, amanhã, as, a, no, no começo da noite, a conferência com o professor David Simon, né, que é, é do estado do Kansas, nos Estados Unidos, mediado pela professora Letícia Pádua, que é da Universidade Federal da, dos Vales do Jequitinhonha e Mucuri. Junto com essas duas mesas, dessas duas conferências, né, com esses convidados que, que teremos, vamos, organizamos também duas mesas redondas com temas é, emergentes, a gente poderia dizer, no âmbito do debate no GUM, um talvez nem tão emergente, né, mais consolidado ou mais frequente, e outro mais recente, né. A primeira mesa redonda que vai acontecer é, nessa tarde, desculpem, nessa noite, a partir das seis e meia da noite, é, tem como tema ancestralidade e colonialidade. Né? Ela vai ser moderada pelo Rafael Bastos Ferreira, né, o nosso colega Rafael, e terá como expositoras a Jamile da Silva Lima Paiaiá, da Universidade do Estado da Bahia, e a Aline Caiapó, né, que é uma das membros fundadoras do movimento Wairacunas Brasil, né, movimento que Jamile também faz parte. E a segunda mesa redonda, que vai ter lugar amanhã, as, iniciando né, às 16 horas da tarde, vai ser mediada pela Tiara Breda, que é da Universidade da Unifespa, né? E terão, terão como expositores o professor Gustavo Silvano Batista, que é também um colega nosso do GUM, que é professor na Universidade Federal do Piauí, e a artista visual Aline Mota, né? que vão abordar o tema Geografar, Memória, Arte e Identidade. É, cada uma dessas atividades, elas vão acontecer em um link diferente do YouTube, todos pelo canal do GUM, né? Então, já tem lá aberto esses links para a gente poder acompanhar. E apenas a Mostra de Artes vai acontecer, o lançamento, né? Nesse mesmo link que nós já estamos. E a, a outra atividade especial que nós teremos, que vai ser junto com a conferência de encerramento, que vai ser a homenagem ao professor João Batista Ferreira de Mello, que é, nos deixou esse ano, e era professor da UERJ, e nós faremos uma singela homenagem a ele, né, em reconhecimento à sua contribuição né, pioneira, ele é um dos primeiros é, geógrafos no Brasil a trabalhar com a geografia humanista, né, então sempre estivemos né, de diferentes formas com ele, e ele conosco, e nós consideramos né, que, nesse momento de tristeza, de despedida dele, nesse ano, nós devemos lhe render essa merecida homenagem. Né? É, uma atividade que foi cancelada, que estava na nossa programação, é um workshop de Geosofia. Infelizmente, é, tivemos problemas para ter o que era necessário para a realização dele agora, então ele foi cancelado. Então, depois... Da, da abertura da Mostra de Artes, nós voltamos apenas né, às seis e meia para a primeira mesa redonda, tá bom? É... Bom, acho que o que eu tinha para falar é isso, a, o, as últimas coisinhas são, vai haver a, o, um link da lista de presença que vai ser disponibilizada pelo chat aí do YouTube, 
Né? Então, aqueles que, aquelas que estão inscritos, a gente pede que, que acompanhe o chat para poder fazer essa confirmação de presença. Ficamos à disposição pelo e-mail do GUM, para qualquer eventualidade nesse formato né, à distância. Então, a gente vai estar tá acompanhando e qualquer dificuldade que aqueles que estão nos acompanhando podem nos escrever por lá. Né? E, é claro, vamos incentivar que possamos não só aproveitar muito esse momento, mas né, fazer questionamentos, questões que vão ser colhidas aí do chat para que a gente possa construir uma interação o melhor possível nesse formato. Então, desejo né, todos uh, um bom evento e agradeço especialmente aos nossos convidados, às nossas convidadas e todos aqueles que estão aqui nos prestigiando, assistindo, né, de suas casas, de onde é que estejam, é, esperando que a gente possa encontrar no 12º Segum, presencialmente, né, e, e é isso, muito obrigado, e agora eu vou passar a palavra para o professor Antônio, para o Felipe, o Felipe e o Antônio, que vão fazer a, a mediação da próxima atividade. Muito obrigado e boa tarde. Boa tarde a todos. Bem-vindo à conferência de abertura do 11º Segundo, com a palestra Atmosferas da Ansiedade, ministrada pelo professor Frigg. Uh, professor Dylan Frigg é pesquisador sênior do Fundo Austríaco de Ciência na Universidade de Viena, Departamento de Filosofia. Ele já ocupou vários cargos, incluindo o Mary Curry International Portugal Fellow na Universidade de Memphis, Departamento de Filosofia na, Univers na Universidade de College Dublin, Irish Research Council Fellow na Universidade College Dublin, pós-doutorado é, nos arquivos de, é, de Husserl na Escola Normal Superior, pós-doutorado no Centro de Pesquisa de Epistemologia Aplicada, ele obteve seu doutorado na Universidade de Sussex, mestrado na Universidade de Sussex, Sussex e bacharelado na Universidade de Londres, Birkbeck College. Ele também foi professor visitante na Universidade de Illinois, em Urbana-Champaign, na Universidade de Arte e Design, na Universidade de Duquesne, é, Simon Silverman Phenomenology Center. Uh, ele é autor de muitos livros, incluindo Topofobia, uma fenomenologia da ansiedade, A Coisa, uma fenomenologia do horror, é, A Memória do Lugar, uma fenomenologia do estranho. Seus interesses de pesquisa incluem fenomenologia, corporidade estética. Ele também está escrevendo um livro sobre nostalgia. <risos> Felipe Aguiar e eu temos a honra de ser anfitriões dessa palestra. Após a palestra, selecionaremos de três questões é, no chat, para conversar um pouco mais é, com o professor Tree. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This conference opens uh, the lab to second if the lecture Atmospheres of Anxiety, given by Professor Tree. I and Felipe Guerra have the honor uh, to be hosting the lecture. After the lecture, we will, uh, we will select a few questions in the chat so that we can talk a bit more to Professor Tree. Felipe. Professor Trigg, we are all happy and honored for having you in our seminar. Thank you for that. And we wish you, you have a good lecture. Thank you for coming. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much. And uh, just to test, you can hear me loud and clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Perfect. great. Great. With that, I'll, we'll then begin. And I'd like to thank uh, Antonio and Philip uh, for their generous invitation to speak here today and to everyone else involved in this event, and uh, not least to have the honor of opening the event, which is um, really a great pleasure, and also to be able to communicate and share ideas from afar. So thank you so much for that, and I look forward to the event and to uh, hearing everyone else's contribution. Well, what I want to speak to you today on is a topic that you may at this point be all too familiar with, and that is COVID-19. Nevertheless, uh, there is no getting around the issue and how it continues to shape our lives. And it's this question of how it shapes our everyday experience that I'd like to reflect on in today's talk. The emergence of the disease known as COVID-19 has caused widespread death and illness, economic unrest and global uncertainty, the impact and extent of which remains presently unknown. Families have been destroyed, jobs lost, and healthcare systems overwhelmed. 
And throughout this, there has also been a growth in anxiety across different populations and across different cultures. Whether it be anxiety relating to health, the economy, relationships, or a more generalized anxiety directed toward future uncertainties, there can be little doubt that COVID-19 is having and will continue to have a sharp impact on mental health. Yet, the, uh, the anxiety produced by COVID-19 is not only an effective state experienced by individuals, it is also something that is extended into the world as part of a general atmosphere. And the idea of anxiety here as a type of atmosphere is in contrast to how the emotion is commonly thought about. So, for example, where atmosphere has the connotation of an effective force that is diffused in the world, we tend to think of anxiety as an emotion uh, experienced by individuals alone. And indeed, this tendency to think of anxiety in indi individualistic terms is already evident in the history of phenomenology. So here we can consider Heidegger, most famously. For Heidegger, anxiety is the philosophical mood par excellence, which strips everyday life of its aura of familiarity and reveals the contingent foundations upon which meaning is constructed. And the result is a feeling of being ill at home in the world as the world reveals itself in its strangeness. While, uh, while Heidegger's account of anxiety has proven to be highly influential within phenomenology and within the humanities more generally, such an account nevertheless tends to prioritize a moment of self-realization for an individual and an individual alone. As a result, what the account neglects is the way that anxiety is distributed through the world and embodied in other people. So in this talk, that I, I would like to uh, propose a challenge to the Heideggerian tradition of treating anxiety as an opportunity for self-transformation by thinking of it in terms of an atmosphere. The concept of atmosphere has gained a significant amount of tension in several disciplines recently or over the last 20 years, especially philosophy, human geography and literary studies. Um, may we have the next slide, please, if you don't mind. If we could. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Notwithstanding the diversity uh, characterizing current research on atmospheres, there are, I think, a number of salient themes common to their conceptualization. Namely, atmospheres are an effective yet indeterminate phenomena that are grasped pre-reflectively, felt corporeally, and given expression through material bodies. Yet despite these common themes, the concept of atmosphere is also inherently and perhaps necessarily ambiguous. This level of amb ambiguity is reflected in questions that populate the literature on atmospheres, concerning, for example, the relationship between atmospheres and mood, the question of where atmospheres derive from, and the question of to what extent atmospheres can be shared. Atmospheres Ambiguity is also captured in an experiential sense, as when we talk about certain rooms as having an eerie, tense, or buoyant atmosphere. In a similar measure, we, can, we frequently talk about political events as having an atmosphere of relief in the context of an election, or otherwise suffering from a fraught atmosphere in the context of ongoing discussions. Terminologies such as these nevertheless belie a complex structure of meanings which are difficult to pin down in unequivocal terms. Yet far from incidental or contingent, the ambiguity peculiar to the concept of atmosphere is, I think, if I may put it paradoxically, what generates its specificity. Indeed, it is precisely because the concept of atmosphere extends beyond the remit of individual emotion, embedding itself in material structures and being enacted through uh, cultural practices, that it has assumed an influence beyond that of any single discipline. Okay, uh, I just had, yeah, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to slow down my talk now a little, just to uh, aid comprehension. Okay. Uh, do let me know if I, if I sort of resume speaking too quickly again. So, in the current talk, 
my core point of departure is that the concept of atmosphere can play a powerful role in one accounting for how anxiety is distributed through the world and two how anxiety can institute and express itself in specific things so i'll repeat that uh, my core point of departure here is one how anxiety is distributed through the world and two how it can articulate itself in specific local things and my test study for this hypothesis is the anxiety tied up with COVID-19. The plan for this study uh, is threefold. And if we may just have the next slide at this point. Uh, okay, on the next slide. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, that's it first. Okay, so the plan is threefold. First of all, I consider the intentional structure of an atmosphere. I give special attention to the way that an atmosphere generates a specific affective style, which is given expression in both a diffused and singular sense. Um, second, and if we may just go to the next slide here, please. I consider one of the salient themes of COVID-19 anxiety, namely staying at home and leaving home. As I argue, COVID-19 is not a discrete and localizable phenomena, but instead a force that redefines boundaries and reconfigures our experience, interpretation and understanding of the outside world. And finally, and if we can have the next slide here, please. Wonderful, thank you. I consider how the lived body is augmented in and through the lens of coronavirus. And I posit that one of the key aspects of COVID-19 is that it thematizes the body in its thing-like status, which in turn issues a challenge to the idea of the body as irreducibly one's own. And then I end by consolidating the role that atmospheres play in synthesizing these elements as a whole. Okay, so with that said, we shall, uh, we shall dive in. So it's worth beginning here by framing the ways that an atmosphere is diffused in an urban environment. And the question of whether such an atmosphere would be felt in a non-urban environment is a critical one, but one which lies outside of the scope of this talk. Nevertheless, given that COVID-19 as a particular kind of disease thrives upon densely populated spaces, it is evident that such spaces are more commonly found in urban environments. And my focus here on urban environments is predicated on the sense that such an environment captures the atmosphere of anxiety in several key respects. And if we may just have the next slide, please. Wonderful, thank you. The first point to note is that a city is never devoid of an atmosphere. Even an innocuous city characterized by homogenous and prefabricated structures, a city of interchangeable megastores, lifeless streets, and an endless parade of concrete, uh, even, such a even such a city carries with it a thick atmosphere. True, the atmosphere in question may be presented in pernicious terms or negative terms as a threat to the notion of a city as having a plentiful or harmonious quality. Uh, but such a resistance simply attests to the weight, to the density of a homogeneous, homogeneous atmosphere as having its own singular quality. More often, however, when we talk about the idea, oh, sorry, when we talk about the atmosphere of a city, then we do so in terms of a tonality that permeates and gives character to a place or what Merleau-Ponty calls a latent sense diffused through the landscape or the town that we uncover in a specific way without having to define it. So here we can consider in very concrete specific terms how we, for example, speak about the romantic atmosphere of Paris, uh, the frantic atmosphere of New York or the imperial atmosphere of Vienna. And what these terms tend to denote is a constellation of historical, cultural, 
political and aesthetic structures cohering into the same orbit. These constellations are not affective elements staged together as an image, though of course they can often be uh, manipulated and sort of marketed in a tourist way, but instead emerge as an affective presence which gives a city a sense of place and which we often just grasp in a pre-reflective and intuitive way. What then does it mean to speak in specific terms about COVID-19 as an atmosphere of anxiety that permeates a city or an urban environment? Uh, so as I will try to spell out in the following section, it means giving some specificity to how an atmosphere affects and shapes cultural and bodily practices, spatial configurations, and ways of being that mark our relationship to spatiality as a whole. On this first point, uh, or oh, sorry, on this point, the first task of this talk is to pose an initial question, namely, from where does this anxiety emerge and where is it located? In asking this question, it becomes necessary, I think, to consider the intentional structure of an atmosphere of anxiety, and that's what I propose to do now. So ordinarily, at least within phenomenology, we understand intentionality as a mental act directed towards discrete objects. So, for example, uh, in classical phenomenology, intentionality refers to how our mental states are always about something. But this quality of being about something is not simply a mental or an intellectual act. It is also uh, embodied, affective and often unconscious, as Merleau-Ponty has shown. Seen in this way, intentionality extends beyond that of a mental act and frames the way in which we engage with the world in a pre-reflective and pre-personal sense. So, for example, to experience the world as an anxious place is not to pose a certain risk with respect to our relationship to the world. Rather, it is to be attuned to the world as a site of meaning that is diffused as a general style. And I'll unpack this a little more in case it's a bit um, uh, sort of jargonistic. So to gain a sense of this with respect to the structure of an atmosphere, let's consider here again in very concrete terms, as I like to do, variations of anxieties associated with COVID-19 and its lockdown. These anxieties range from issues concerning the absence of social life to concerns over finances and to a sense of being ill at ease while outside during a lockdown. Um, in each of these variations, the lived experience of anxiety is irreducible to a singular thematic object. Instead, the anxiety is diffused through the environment in a non-containable way. It cannot be contained to one single thing. So when we talk here of the atmosphere of anxiety under COVID-19, then it would be difficult quite difficult to pinpoint with accuracy where that anxiety is actually located. Of course, specific features may well present themselves in a more focal way than others. For example, a discomfort with being outside, a concern over the future, the onset of a new cough and so on and so forth. But aspects such as these are expressions of an already existing atmosphere rather than a containable and delimited uh, token of anxiety. In this respect, instead of being directed towards a discrete thing, the intentional direction of an atmosphere is diffused to the world in a multiplicity of ways. And if at this point, may we just have the uh, next slide here too, please. Thank you so much. For this reason, an atmosphere does not present itself perceptually as a containable object in the way that a chair or a table does. Rather, there is a porous and dynamic quality to an atmosphere insofar as it establishes a field of meaning, a field of meaning before it is understood as such, i.e. it's already there uh, within our perceptual experience before we then begin to reflect and think about it in abstraction. 
So to give some flesh to these concepts, consider here the example of being in a supermarket. And by the way, I have to uh, uh, preface this uh, point that the, the much of what I'm describing here is peculiar to uh, the first lockdown during COVID-19. So, of course, many of these anxieties, as they are articulated now, may have been dissipated or mitigated to some extent uh, after the vaccine. This, this, uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking more about the early days of COVID. So during the initial stages of the lockdown, media reports, uh, sorry, may we also have the next slide as well here, please. Thank you so much. Media reports were saturated with accounts of shortages in the supply chain, especially concerning the availability of hand sanitizer and toilet paper, the consumption and in turn shortage of which became emblematic of a new age of anxiety at least within the covid era how can we understand this well on the surface the logic of panic buying seems to be motivated by a desire to generate a sense of control in a situation where uncertainty is rampant yet the onset of panic buying is also propelled by the notion of anxiety as a contagious phenomena which emerges from a more global atmosphere of unrest after all, the stockpiling of supplies does not derive from a mode of rational reflection upon the needs of an individual or a group. Rather, it is given forth through an ambient tonality that is felt in the streets and in the comportment of other people. The, this atmosphere of anxiety is also articulated in the supermarket itself. So under lockdown, the supermarket has become a place rich with multiple forms of anxiety. It is a place that one must venture into in a focused and precise way, careful to both avoid getting too close to other people, but also ensuring to uh, avoid unnecessary, unnecessarily touching surfaces that may be contaminated. It is also a place where there is a sense of being exposed to danger while carrying out the most fundamental, if not primitive, of tasks, gathering food. As such, the supermarket is a essential place, both in terms of its sociological and economic value, but also in terms of providing the basic fundaments of existence. And so, therefore, for many people, indeed all of us, arguably, surely, are an unavoidable excursion that we all have to take. Of course, there are also delivery services, but that's another narrative. Each of these aspects does not necessarily hold greater sway over another aspect. Rather, each expression of anxiety emerges in a dynamic and fluid way. So the atmosphere of anxiety peculiar to the supermarket effectively seeps through the whole place, affecting both people and things within its sphere of influence. Um, so as the famous philosopher of uh, atmospheres, Gernhold Berm writes, quote, we are unsure where they are. Atmospheres seem to fill the space with a certain tone of feeling like a haze, end quote. As omnipre omnipresent within a given space, we find ourselves gripped by an atmosphere, affected by it insofar as it gets under our skin. In this respect, the atmosphere of anxiety within a supermarket exacts a power over the individuals within it. And unless we have somehow cultivated a method of tuning it out or tuning ourselves out, then we remain, for better or worse, affected by the tonality at work. So, next section. From a general tonality in the air, we move on now to a specific to a series of specific articulations of COVID-19 as an atmosphere. One way this atmosphere is given dominant expression is through the injunction to stay at home. And this slogan, which was repeated throughout press, press, press briefings uh, and throughout the media more broadly, establishes a sharp delineation of the urban environment that was hitherto largely inconceivable for the majority of people. So the prospect of having to stay at home was unthinkable, not only empirically, but also in terms of how we ordinarily understand our relationship to the surrounding world. For the most part, we take for granted the idea of home 
not only as a discrete place in the world, but also as a mode of being in the world more generally. To be at home in the world means being situated in a milieu that is framed by a movement of possibility. We are, in other words, at home in the world insofar as the world continues to renew itself in a dynamic and spontaneous way, revealing itself each time as a nexus of complex meanings. On an experiential level, this sense of the world as homely presents itself with an atmosphere of constancy. And if we may just have the next slide at this point, please. Uh, sorry, next slide, actually. Yes, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Generally speaking, the world appears to us with an air of familiarity, such that we always have a sense of where we are, even when we're lost. Over time, people and places intertwine and we become attached to neighborhoods, cities and entire countries until they sediment themselves as part of the fabric of our identity. Understood in this way, to leave home, to venture forth into the world, is to frame the physical home as a point of departure. Home, understood in this way, is not limited to a physical site, but is instead formulated as a sense of being at the home, sorry, being at home within the world more generally. In this way, home uh, refer, indexes as much an environment in the world as it does a specific kind of implicit relationship we have to that environment from which our actions emotions and intentions emerge against this atmosphere of tacit confidence and taken for granted certainty the injunction to stay at home establishes a radically different idea of the home itself instead of being a concept diffused through the world the notion of home during COVID-19 is reduced reduced to a physical dwelling where one is obliged indeed obligated to be the implication is that while home uh, while possibly mitigating some of the dangers associated with covid nevertheless becomes a place less a place of sanctuary and more a site of constriction and tedium which seals the dweller from the world and fragments a meaningful sense of being at home in the world for many people the home that is now the center of, the, of life is not quite the place it once was as sealed from the world home is not a porous concept that spills into the world rather it is a end point that fragments referential meaning and engenders and produces a sense of the world as compressed moreover the very phenomenology the very uh, experience of the home itself has changed now home is understood as a site of potential contamination that has to be disinfected and sterilized before it can be before it can open itself up to being dwelt in once more the result is an articulation of the home as that which is simultaneously homely and unhomely personal and impersonal and familiar and unfamiliar in the same measure and of course there's lots here to say about the home has uncanny in this respect. Notably, this onus on staying at home as a series has a series of critical consequences for our relationship to the outside. So in typical circumstances, the boundary between inside and outside is porous. We move from the home with an implicit trust that the outside is neither an, an affront to our existence nor in sharp contrast to it. In this respect, distance and movement are understood not as abstract grids of reference that are mapped out in advance. Rather, they are textures and contours of a living and lived spatiality which are grasped in an affective sense. Here, the already familiar world is presented through an unfamiliar lens. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, during the initial phases of lockdown, the, un, the already familiar world is presented through an unfamiliar lens where movement becomes tentative and framed at all times by a gesture of constriction. Moving from one place to another 
So, for example, from the home to the supermarket becomes less a mindless activity uh, carried out as part of the fabric of everyday life and more a series of movements which demand that we have to restructure our relationship to the world. In effect, spatiality as a constant flow of emergent properties has become, dissect, has become a dissected cluster of habitable and uninhabitable zones. The result is something like a double bind in which both public and private space are equally infected by the atmosphere of COVID-19. As one individual says in an interview with Time magazine, quote, I'm concerned about going into public, but now I'm also concerned about how long I can last without going out, which I think is a very nice way to put it. OK, let's move on to the next section here. And if we can just have the next slide, please. Great. Uh, 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 I do beg your pardon. Uh, Yes, yeah, sorry, that's fine. Alongside this unnatural and disturbed relationship to the outside, the materiality of the world also assumes a strange tonality. The world, as it is commonly understood and experienced, is suddenly suspended. And it is true on the surface, it, it, it appears as though nothing significant has changed. Buildings remain intact. People can, see, can be seen uh, casually milling about and some shops are even open for business. The world has not collapsed and the end, if it is conceivable in this respect, has also not arrived. Yet in the midst of this apparent normality, a deadly pandemic has taken hold, which creates a series of subtle shifts in our everyday experience. While still available to us, the outside world is nevertheless experienced through a hypersensitized lens in which tactility plays uh, as much a role as, sorry, as a dominant role as vision does. Consider here how surfaces that were once invisible and innocuous have now become charged with a sense of being sites of disease. Everyday objects such as phones, doorknobs, elevator buttons, etc., are also altered from familiar tokens of everydayness residing in the background to objects charged with an aura of danger. In no uncertain terms, COVID-19 has issued a stark challenge to the idea of human experience as being structured and centered by vision as the dominant sense. In place of this notion, it is touch that has now become our primary mode of being in the world. So the injunction, for example, to avoid touching one, one's own face and surfaces more generally, reinstates the porous interplay between ourselves and the world. We are not discrete subjects gazing upon an otherwise uh, blank world. Rather, to put it in Merleau-Pontian terms, just as the world, just as we touch the world with our sensing organs, so the world touches us back. Only now, the world that is reverse in our touch is a world marked by disease. As such, our relationship to the world is one that has to be kept at arm's length. Instead of greeting people with our entire bodies, we have had to contrive novel ways to interact with people without spreading the disease. And instead of freely touching the world around us, we have we have to exercise caution about which surfaces it is necessary to engage with in order to perform basic functions. As fundamentally altered, therefore, the world and its material things protrudes into our experience and becomes thematized as a certain kind of strangeness. True to the nature of an atmosphere, this permeation of anxiety is not localized to the lockdown itself, but is instead poured out into life after lockdown, which I think uh, is certainly a problem that many of us are facing now in this sort of strange period, limbo period, uh, somehow after COVID, when COVID is not quite fully over. So, for example, Lily Brown, the director of the Center for the Treatment and Study of Anxiety at the University of Pennsylvania, remarks as follows, I quote, some people are anxious because they have a lurking fear of catching or spreading COVID, or others have fallen out of practice socializing and are finding it difficult to resume. 
which I think is a very good point, end quote. So we see that the hazy quality of, a, of an atmosphere, which again populates the literature, is at once not only spatial, it's also temporal. Atmospheres do not reach a neat end point in tandem with a sequence of dates, i.e. being vaccinated or i.e. Uh, when lockdown is uh, lifted. Rather, the anxiety spills into the present like trails from the past. Consider here how atmospheres can often linger of, uh, under our skin after we have left a place or a situation from where that atmosphere derived. Um, this is evident as much on a subjective and personal scale as it is on a cultural and political level, as when we talk about the atmosphere of one decade seeping into the beginning of the following decade. Likewise, the, atmos the anxiety associated with COVID marks a lurking fear that continues to affect our behavior, thought and actions in a number of ways. As Lily Brown remarked above, this fear is captured as an epistemic gap in our knowledge of the world and as a set of bodily practices that have been attuned to a climate of tension and which require a certain amount of retraining in order for us to adjust to life after lockdown. Uh, the results of these dynamics is that dwelling in the world has been in a way put out of joint. Uh, and if we may just have the next slide here, please. Great, thank you so much. So being, at, being ill at home in the world, to use this Heideggerian language, means being confronted with a world in which the meaning underpinning actions, intentions and thoughts has fragmented. Into this, things no longer assume the value that they once did, and the everyday itself as a nexus of relational meanings loses a certain kind of referential value. And as a result, anxiety permeates much of life. Central to this anxiety, which I haven't mentioned now, up until now, but I will mention from here on, is the role that the body plays in giving expressive form to an atmosphere. So let's consider the role that the body plays uh, in more detail within the atmosphere of anxiety peculiar to COVID-19. Now, in normal life, uh, we generally take our bodies like we do spatiality in a taken for granted way. Like the homes that we dwell in, we have a trust in our bodies that provides a sense of continuity over time. Moving in and through the world, we do so, generally speaking, with a tacit sense of our bodies as generating a sense of directional, affective and intersubjective awareness. Meeting other people, we have an implicit sense of how to conduct ourselves in proximity to other bodies. So consider here how distance and proximity are not spaces that we measure in abstraction, but rather degrees of intentional awareness that we grasp from an experiential perspective. And if we may just have the next slide at this point, please. Great, thank you. Phenomenology, of course, has provided an abundance of attention to the modality, to this modality of embodied life. It is a body that is engaged in the world in a fundamentally affirmative way. It is a body that relates to the world in the form of a I can rather than a I cannot. And it is a body that is intertwined with other bodies in a fluid and dynamic way. It is, in other words, or in, uh, in phenomenological terminology, a body that is always already one's own. Within the research on atmospheres, this kind of body, this presentation of the body has assumed a critical role. Consider here how atmospheres are not only extended into the world, but they're also grasped in and through the body. In the language of uh, Hermann Schmitz, the, 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 the uh, pioneer and philosopher of atmospheres, the body as felt is extended into the world insofar as it is constantly affected by the world. So in other words, the body is not a atomic entity, but an opening that is co-constituted by the spaces that we inhabit and that we dwell in. Accordingly, just as spaces expand and contract with different affective structures, so too do our bodies. Yet the embodied experience of COVID-19 does not simply concern 
a body that has been infected by disease in a medical sense. More complex than this, the disease transforms the lived experience of one's own body more generally into an agent of anxiety, whether a person is infected with COVID-19 or not. And this articulation of anxiety through the body has, I think, at least two respects to it. First, in terms of one's own relationship to their body, and second, in terms of one's relationship to other bodies. So to begin with the first case, one of the striking aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic is the modification of the body from a center of intimacy and familiarity to a site of suspicion and otherness. It is a body that is not only at risk of becoming diseased, but also of becoming a source of alienation. One way that this manifests itself is in terms of the body becoming objectified as a carrier, as a potential carrier of disease. And much of the media narratives concerning COVID-19 focus on this elevation of anxiety in the population with a specific focus on the heightened attention to changes felt in the experience of the body. So again, whereas the body is ordinarily a tacit presence in our everyday life, in the age of COVID-19, signs and symptoms emanating from the body acquire a halo of meaning, usually reserved for periods of illness and injury. A first person report here from the Washington Post captures this amplification of meaning quite vividly. And if we may just have the next slide here, please. Well, thank you so much. Quote, a thermometer sits on the windowsill of my bathroom right next to the toilet. So every time that I go to the bathroom, I can take my temperature. I've been feeling like that, sorry, like I have a low grade fever for weeks. And these days a fever isn't just a fever, it's a signal that you may have coronavirus. And so I take my temperature about eight times a day to see if my fever has risen, end quote. What is notable about this passage and many others like it within the uh, media is that instead of being a, a center of lived meanings, the lived body is now reduced to a thing-like body, a thing-like body that has become foregrounded in its biological materiality. As understood in classical terms, the thing-like nature of the body is the dimension of bodily life that materializes when the body is a physical thing is foregrounded through pain, illness, fatigue, psychopathologies, aging, and so on and so forth. So in moments of sickness, the body ceases to be an implicit structure and is instead presented to us as a focal point of perception which can disturb our sense of selfhood. Likewise, catching sight of our bodies as having aged, uh, we tend to experience a gap between who we think we are and our bodies, which, as it were, has trailed off on its own. I experience I know all too well. In each case, the body is rendered a thing that we observe and monitor for further changes and which we have little power, which we have uh, little or no power over. The same structure is no less true in the case of COVID-19. The COVID-19 body is not only an ill body in the sense of being infected by disease, it is also ill insofar as it has become a site of suspicion, generating a hypochondriac, if not paranoid, relationship to the body's materiality. As Kevin Ahu, the American phenomenologist, writes in his incisive essay on the uncanniness of coronavirus, uh, quote here, my hands have become eerily conspicuous like strange objects that I am only contingently connected to, Worried about contracting the virus, I no longer reach for the doorknob of the cell phone, nor do I extend my hand in a warm greeting when a friend comes by. End quote. Ahu, Kevin Ahu here draws our attention to the manner in which the body has become mediated through an atmosphere of anxiety. It is not that the hand as a discrete organ has become an object of anxiety in and of itself. Rather, the hand gives expression to an anxiety that has already been instituted by the onset of COVID-19. In correspondence, sensations, which previously had a contextual meaning with, in relationship to the everyday, i.e. headaches, tiredness, fatigue, and so on and so forth, all now point towards a singular 
horizon, namely COVID-19. At the heart of this logic is the uncertainty of what is at stake in each of the body's processes, responses and symptoms. The body that is presented to us in the face of COVID-19 is in large an unknown and unknowable body. It is a body that is ambiguous, not only in terms of being both a thing and a center of perception, but also in terms of being uh, both mine and not mine simultaneously. But it's not only our own bodies that undergo a shift in their affective structure, but also, of course, our relationship to other bodies. Usually, uh, our communication with others is orchestrated on a pre-reflective level, thanks to the kinship that we have of one body to another. Again, to put it in Merleau-Pontian terms, bodies grasp each other thanks to the fact that there is a primordial liaison between oneself and another. So, for example, without having to think about it in abstraction, on an experiential level, we grasp moods, modes of conduct, and affective and emotional states in an intuitive way. Uh, if we could just have the next slide, please. Lovely, thank you. As a sense in organ, my body puts me in contact with other bodies, not as a recipient of static data, but as a network of constantly unfolding dynamic and expressive meanings. What this means is that notwithstanding the spe specificity of cultural and affective differences, for the most part, affective, sorry, excuse me, for the most part, social life is regulated by a pre-reflective fluidity that operates on a latent rather than reflective level. And such a dynamic is predicated on the idea of the body as an expressive system. Now, one of the salient aspects of COVID-19 is that it issues a challenge to this phenomenological idea of intercorporeality, this idea of bodies as being intertwined in a pre-reflective way. And this is evident, I think, in at least two key respects. First, as expressive and bodily beings, we are, whether we like it or not, uh, always in touch with other bodies. Again, this is especially true from a Merleau-Pontian perspective. As he sees it, one's own body is not a discrete mass of materiality surveying the world from afar. Rather, it is part of a system which is interwoven in the fabric of other bodies, irrespective of our own idiosyncrasies and preferences. So in other words, you can't really get away from other people. And even if you flee, then this itself is a verification of the other's presence. Already having a body means being in touch with other bodies, each of whom belongs to the same ontological order of life. This is true as much on a structural level as it is on a sensual level. So just as touch involves a reversible movement between ourselves and the world, so the same is true of other of other intercorporeal aspects of life. And here we can consider the example of breathing. As bodily beings, breathing is not a private practice sealed off from a neutral world. It is a porous, indeed you might say, emblematically atmospheric exchange that reinstates that we are as much in the world as the world is in us. Breathing brings to light, in quite a literal way, our inheritance with others and our liaison and commitment to a shared space. It is true the manner in which this space is shared and shareable is mediated by any number of socio-cultural uh, norms which either amplify or underplay a sense of space as ours rather than one's own. Yet from the outset, breathing connects us. It connects us to a common world in which our inhalation and exhalation is both biological but also affective. And it is only later on when we acquire a sense of breathing as belonging to one's own body that a more rigid boundary line is cultivated between inside and out. For this reason, uh, breathing is also interwoven with anxiety 
in so much as it indexes a site of vulnerability in our being in the world. As one report attests, again, this is from a media source, uh, here I quote, being around others, especially strangers and crowds, has become an anxiety-ridden proposition. As much as we yearn in to be with people again, we can't help but think of the risks. Is this stranger's cough the one that will infect me? End quote. So just as breathing dissolves the separation of self and other, so it introduces an aspect of anxiety, the manifestation of which is nothing less than breathing itself. Indeed, it is quite notable, I think, that within the history of anxiety, as told from a phenomenological perspective, it is breathing that comes up time and again as the main expression. And uh, if we could just have the next quote here, please. Great, thank you. So here we can think of Heidegger's account of anxiety as being, quote, so close that it is oppressive and it stifles one, one's breath. Or, or uh, in parallel, Sartre's account of nausea as a vision that leaves one breathless. In each case, breathing takes shape in the midst of an affective atmosphere, uh, mirroring the surrounding space in terms of being constricted and taut. As the surrounding world becomes oppressive, so too does our breathing. It becomes felt as a force of oppression, a point that is especially pertinent to COVID-19, insofar as one of the, the disease's principal symptoms is, of course, a shortness of breath. One of the salient aspects affecting breathing during COVID-19 has been the introduction of face masks. Uh, the omnipresence of the face mask is both a marker of a new modality of breathing, now more inward and self-reflexive, but also a marker of our relation with others. What this discloses is that the face is not insulated by the skin as a protective membrane, nor is the face simply an assemblage of parts. Rather, it is a dynamic network which conveys meaning. Likewise, a mouth is not just a sector of the body employed for consumption and breathing. It is also a space in and through which intersubjective life is given affective expression. As Merleau-Ponty writes, I perceive the other's grief or anger in his behavior, on his face and in his hands, without any burrowing from an inner experience of suffering. End quote. As a totality, then, the eyes do not perform the work of the mouth, as though they were interchangeable and modular parts. Rather, the face unfolds as a gestalt, and when this totality is obscured, the pre-reflective background upon which human communication takes place is broken and something else intervenes in this fragmentation which is often grasped as a moment of suspicion and indeed it is this atmosphere of suspicion that is another key feature of our relationship with others stripped of a primary mode of expression the other has become deprived of their singularity and rendered an anonymous mass of biological and potentially infected flesh. And if we may just have the next slide here as I come towards a conclusion. Thank you so much. Against this, the other's presence is now measured in strictly quantitative terms, underpinned at all times by a anxiety over being too close to strangers, lest they be carriers of the disease, even or especially unknown to themselves. Indeed, the structure of intercorporeal existence, as it has been instituted in our present era, centers on a series of new practices, each of which demand that we rehabitualize our bodies, often in a counterintuitive way, to conform to a language of disease and distance. The result is a sense of alienation from both ourselves and from others. Well, let me end here, if I may, by summarizing why the concept of atmosphere, as it has been employed within this, within the phenomenological tradition and more broadly, is, I think, beneficial to accounting for the affective structure of COVID-19 in comparison to, say, the terminology of feeling, emotion and moods, although those concepts also play a key role, but that's a whole other debate. Well, the, cons the close connection here between the concept of atmosphere and adjoining notions 
such as existential feeling, as it has been employed by Matthew Radcliffe, has meant that generating analytical conceptual clarity has often been difficult in the research on atmospheres. Nevertheless, while both emotions and feelings tend to index affective structures constituted by individuals, Atmospheres, I think, are spatially distributed, not delimited to individuals, and potentially perceived on an intersubjective and therefore shared level. In this respect, the concept of atmosphere generates a more complex phenomenology than that of emotion alone. Atmosphere is both the structure upon which emotions and feelings are instituted, while also being a specific kind of affective phenomena which I, in which intentionality is directed towards. Now, this double-sided aspect of atmosphere has been evident, I hope, in this talk in several respects, and I'll just outline those now as I come towards the end. So if we just may have the next slide, please. Wonderful, thank you. So first, I have tried to demonstrate how, anxiety, how the anxiety co-constituted with coronavirus is diffused to the world in a given environment in a multi-directional and non-linear way. And what this means is that instead of being directed towards a discrete thing, uh, as an atmospheric force, COVID-19 is distributed through the world on a latent or operative or pre-reflective level, but also as a thematic and reflective horizon. And as much as we talk and reflect about COVID-19 as a particular kind of disease to be treated and managed, so it already forms a meaningful context from which thoughts and actions emerge. Such is the specific structure of an atmosphere. It gives expression in and through singular things without being reducible to those things, and instead generating a kind of hazy style that permeates everything, everywhere. Uh, if we may have the next slide, please. Thank you. And yet, as I've also tried to show, an atmosphere has certain privileged modes of expression, not least home and the body. So where the home is concerned, there is a transformation from a physical home as a, as a sanctuary to a site of restriction, while the surrounding world now appears thematically present as an uncanny terrain which is marked by danger and risk. Uh, excuse me. The same is uh, no less true of the human body. The body of COVID-19 is not simply an ill body ravaged by disease. It is also an anxious body, a suspicious body, a distanced body, and a concealed body. In a word, the body has become a site of disruption insofar as it indexes a disorder in our normative understanding of the world. And if we may just have the final slide, please. Thank you. In sum, the concept of atmosphere can play a critical role as part of a phenomenological toolkit, uh, if you want to use that phrase, in accounting for how complex effective structures are distributed in and through an environment and through multiple subjectivities. As a confluence of subjectivity, materiality, and affect, an atmosphere resists being categorically defined in an analytical way. For that matter, the concept of atmosphere also resists being delimited and reduced to human emotion alone. An atmosphere of anxiety, as it has been dealt, uh, dealt with, I hope, in this talk, is as much embedded in spatial configurations, in places and in buildings, as it is in the crowds and individuals who populate those buildings. And in this respect, by focusing on the materialization of emotion, atmospheres, I hope, offer a potentially vital counterpoint to theories of emotion the privilege interior and individual existence and on that note it just remains for me to thank you again uh, thank you firstly we thanks professor trig for the lecture now we have a simple question and uh, that people wrote uh, in the chat and if possible we would like to listen to you a bit more about the person team uh philippe please uh, first of all professor uh, i need to thank you for your lecture i would like to tell you that during the, the lecture we had 
around 100 people for uh, watching us on YouTube and some comments and now I will read some questions we, we took from the chat and it would be good uh, if you if you could answer uh, in, in parts to facilitate the translation, Antonio sure. and I will, will make, okay? No problem. The first question we have, Professor, is since place is not only physical or material ground, but is most of our relationship and people's meaning, is it possible to say anxiety atmospheres are potentially also placelessness processes? Thank you. That's a very nice question. That's a very nice question. Um, well, in a, okay, I'll, I'll just go slowly. Um, I think there are, there are a number of ways to respond to this. Um, one of the, what, I mean, I'm very, I'm very interested in the mention here of placelessness, and uh, of course, within the uh, human. Uh, within phenomenological geography, of course, this has a very rich um, uh, significance uh, within the context of uh, uh, Edward Ralph's work, and of course David Seaman, who, who you have speaking tomorrow. And within that context, um, I think so, you know one one could argue uh, if you if you're going to speak about an atmosphere of anxiety against phenomenological or within the context of phenomenological geography, then a lot of um, places or uh, non or placelessness, placeless places um, have often been presented in pernicious negative terms as cultivating and generating um, uh, affective disquiet or let's or even anxiety. Um, and you know, one of one of the uh, topics that I'm sort of quite passionate about is um, rallying against that because I I I I don't like this idea of delineating um, certain places in advance as having certain affective attributes. So this is why I'm very interested in the idea of home. You know, which we is is within the phenomenological tradition and within the tradition of phenomenological geography um you know is is often presented as the emblematic expression of place sense of place and of course you know one with a, a tremendously rich illustration of that is the beautiful work of bachelard you know and that kind of tradition also extends at least into the sort of this the people after bachelard who um you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so, so in that context, I think there is something to be said there, certainly for the way in which certain affective states are, are uh, uh, frequently ascribed as having value within certain places. But just, and just finally, um, can we think about anxiety? I mean, and also I would say, uh, 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 just to conclude, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Anxiety does articulate itself in specific places. Uh, you know, of course, one way in which that's apparent is uh, in phobic relationships. And I've also done a lot of work on that on various forms of spatial phobia. Um, but, you know, if we true to the nature of anxiety, anxiety is not just uh, reducible to specific kinds of relationships. It does also have this placeless. I mean, I don't know if placeless is the correct term, but it has this. I would rather say sort of more diffused quality. It's it's hard to pinpoint um, where the anxiety is located. So uh, so certainly, I think that kind of terminology is 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 definitely very helpful in thinking through these kinds of issues. So I thank you. I thank the uh, the uh, respondent there for 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 the question. Thank you. Okay, Professor. Now I will translate to Portuguese. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize. Okay, yeah, sorry, go. É, o, em geral, o professor coloca que há muitas formas de responder né, essa pergunta que foi feita. 
e ele tem interesse nesse tema e a geografia fenomenológica né, também conserva esse mesmo esse mesmo interesse, mas que em alguns casos o que nós vemos é a é o fato de atribuirmos a alguns locais ali a qualidade de, de lugares com sentido, de lugares afetivos e não é nessa perspectiva que o professor é, trabalha e ele não concorda muito com essa visão as atmosferas, nesse caso aqui, né, de angústia, elas têm, sim, uma relação com o lugar, né, mas elas não são só isso, né, elas estão para além dessa relação. Obviamente, em alguns lugares nós podemos perceber mais, em outros lugares percebemos menos essa relação entre é, o lugar e a, e a angústia. Mas a gente não pode reduzir isso a dizer que esse lugar ele tem um, um laço afetivo, ou não, não é nessa perspectiva que delimita que o professor trabalha, né? Ele coloca que ele vai ao lado contrário dessa perspectiva que delimita esses lugares como afetivos ou não, à medida que é característica deles. Antônio, você quer acrescentar alguma coisa? Não, não, Felipe. É... Ok, vamos para a segunda questão. Uh, professor, now I will read the second question. Thank you for your answer. Uh, how placelessness is understood for you in this contest? Sorry, in what context? In the context of COVID-19 or? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess that would just sort of uh, be a further elaboration on um, my previous point. But I mean, I would I would just say more broadly, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm um, skeptical, if not slightly hostile or not hostile but it's like uh, very uh i you know I'm, I, i the the terminology of place and placelessness for me is problematic um because it uh delimits and it thematizes and it characterizes certain forms of place in advance in a prescriptive way um and i find that problematic because it precludes it arguably precludes certain types of relationships that we can have with places that are given a negative evaluation within um this literature and within this framework so you know very um again this is sort of something i've uh been concerned with for, for a very ridiculously long time really about you know the places that are usually characterized in these terms um airports shopping malls you know homogenous places you know sort of I identikit streets and you know places that are framed as being um exemplary manifestations of this kind of anodyne modernity um uh you know it for me um it's not enough it's that's it's not enough to grasp the significance and the complexity of a place by dividing it bet between various divisions whether it be place and placelessness place and non-place and there's a lot of variations and of course they have subtle differences therein but i mean for example you know the relationship that we have with places transforms and it transforms in and through different affective states and you know one of the, just to one of the things that i'm working on now is nostalgia and um many of the places and many of the things that were um let's say originally thought of as being disposable and interchangeable and forgettable um, in their original incarnation in their original existence especially shopping malls which i'm very concerned about or very interested in undergo a process of transformation and they have a rebirth of meaning uh, through different affective through different cultural, through different sociological, through different aesthetic states. So I find 
I find uh, describing or characterizing certain places in advance um, in this prescriptive way problematic, very problematic. So I, I'm suspicious of it. Nice, professor. Thank you for answering. É, então, o professor coloca que ele tem uma, uma questão é, em relação à terminologia, né, que foi parte da pergunta, placelessness, e aí ele apresenta é, por que ele tem certa, certo receio dessa terminologia, né, que é uma terminologia que vai buscar delimitar né, lugares como placelessness ou outro, outro termo, e aí ele apresenta que há uma complexidade muito grande né, para delimitarmos esses lugares dessas duas formas em específico. E ele apresenta que ele é, acredita que há mais aí uma, uma questão de multiplicidades e de diferentes formas de experienciar o lugar, né, do que essas duas delimitações apenas podem apresentar. Então, ele investe nessa, nessa resposta. É, thank you, professor. I will take the other question. Uh, yes, please. Violins. Home is an important geographical essence or concept. Since COVID, it has received new layers. Place of labor, online socialization. Phenomenologically, should we rethink home as an intimate place? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think many of us, of course, have been forced to rethink it and um i mean what's been interesting that since the inception or since since the covid started that there have been a series of different transitions that have um that we've had to the relationship to the home at least as it's been uh you know told within social media and within and within the media more generally so for example you know you can think here about in the initial phases of COVID, there was in a way this slightly sort of uh, sentimental, romanticized idea of staying at home, um, uh, you know, of sort of slowing life down and rediscovering the richness of home. And, you know, a lot of um, kind of like social media uh, narratives were about, you know, things like sewing and cooking and all these sort of kind of like domestic tasks and there was a sort of buoyancy there's a kind of warmth to it which was fine um but then as covid sort of outstayed its welcome if you like and became you know more than this like seasonal um trend uh the relationship to the home and the presentation of the home became i think more problematic and the sort of narratives of constriction and narratives of uh um anxiety indeed started to appear not only in terms of um feeling cloistered you know feeling kind of like uh encaged within one's home but also in terms of being sealed from the outside world you know there was this the, the, the sort of the, the boundary became hardened encrusted rigid And then, as as the question, as this, as the incisive uh, uh, question uh, indicates, then you also you introduce into this other aspects of the home, and I think it has been a challenge for many people to um, draw a distinction between working at home and um, having a home as a place of repose, and of course that has generated additional pressures, not only in terms of mental health but also in terms of relationships with uh, the people that we live with um phenomenologically uh this is a very the final point of this question is very interesting um should we rethink home as an intimate place yes i think we should i mean well i think one of the um deficiencies in phenomenology and in within human geography is to prioritize and is to um thematize this idea of home as a harmonious, uh, felicitous place, to put it in terms of Gaston Bachelard. And of course, within the history of classical phenomenology, there's been a complete neglect of the problematic, pernicious, negative aspects of home. Um, not only in terms of 
uh, affective disorders, but also in terms of relationship disorders, abusive relationships and things like this. Um, so I think, I think, and I think phenomenology is now beginning to assume a more critical relationship to the home, not least under the articulation of what is called critical phenomenology. And I think that that should certainly be welcomed, you know, not only thinking about home as a, this kind of classical place of, uh, reverie and intimacy and sort of ideas of sanctuary, but also as having this sort of troubled dimension to it. Um, uh, that troubled dimension has manifestly and viscerally articulated itself in COVID-19, but I think it was there all along and it has been there all along, but up until this point, neglected. Professor, would you mind repeating this last part, please? Uh, yeah, so the last part was that this idea of home within the history of phenomenology as problematic as having this um, under uh, sort of um, aspect to it that is alienating, that is troubled, that is disturbed, you know, uncanny to put it in uh, Freudian terms, has been there from the outset, but it's been neglected within the history of phenomenology. COVID-19 has brought it to the foreground in a very visceral way. And I, I think that that to put it in positive terms, uh, is an invitation for phenomenology to rethink the idea of home in a more critical way. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, então, o professor, ele apresenta que, que sim, né, muitos de nós foram forçados a repensar esse sentido e que no início da, 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 da quarentena né, provocada pela covid é, houve um, um sentido mais romantizado, né? a própria mídia colocava de forma mais romantizada essa questão do ficar em casa, né? e aí a gente pode ter alguns slogans como cozinhar, fazer as atividades domésticas, né? fizeram parte dessa, dessa primeira fase, mas que depois isso assume um outro caráter né? e a gente começa a ter outros tipos de relações com isso que a gente chama de, de casa. Ele coloca que essa questão da... Da, da casa, né, e aí, como foi colocado na pergunta, ela é um pouco problemática, de certo modo, quando busca fazer essa romantização, né, do que está sendo tratado como casa. Mas que, sem dúvida alguma, nesse momento, os limites se tornaram mais, mais rígidos, né, essa própria noção de casa, de estar em casa, de estar fora de casa. Então, houve uma transformação no sentido disso, que fez com que esses limites se tornassem mais rígidos. É, o professor também apresenta que muitas pessoas têm a dificuldade de fazer a diferenciação entre trabalhar e trabalhar em casa, né? Que é uma questão que tem sido muito, muito discutida. Em relação à própria história da fenomenologia e aí da geografia humanista também, o professor coloca que essa ideia de casa, ela veio passando uma transformação, né? Com o passar do tempo, no início ela é um pouco ela foi um pouco criticada por conta da forma como era entendida no início das investigações, mas que ela veio assumindo um outro caráter, que ele vê como algo positivo, né? essa visão mais crítica que está sendo colocada. Antônio, você quer acrescentar alguma coisa? Sim, é, porque ele acaba mencionando também, dentro desse contexto é, da história da fenomenologia e, e da geografia, as abordagens de diferentes temas, diferentes preocupações que cada um vai tendo no decorrer do seu próprio desenvolvimento. Né? Isso aí ele acabou frisando no meio da fala dele, é, que se diz é, que está na segunda parte dessa pergunta. Né? Então, acho, acho que, que seja isso. Né? Se você for... Ok. Uh, professor, I will take the another question. It's... Could, could we say that staying at home for so long has somehow our sense of place? Could it be that our body sensibilities have become ill? Uh, yeah, that's a great question also. Um, I think our, our bodily sensibilities have certainly been um, put out of joint and certainly have been displaced. And, um, you know, this is not only, I think, a question of... Um, having to spend uh, 
you know, time, uh, so much time at home. It's also a question of, um, I think, becoming maladjusted, maladjusted to um, being with others. And of course, we can't separate uh, being at home from a social and interpersonal realm. And I think there is, um, you know, certainly something to be said for the necessity of um, a kind of acclimatization period that will, will and I think is necessary to, um, to, to feel kind of comfortable again. And I don't know if I, I don't know if ill is the right word, but certainly, um, certainly yeah maladjusted and certainly and certainly displaced let's say i mean um you know i just came uh to the uk yesterday as my first travel since covid uh so in almost two years and um certainly if i may speak anecdotally there's a lot of anxiety not only in terms of the usual anxiety that can often accompany travel or flight um, but also um, acclimatizing to not only the density of people but also different cultural practices uh, and how the how different cultural practices um, respond to COVID and how they respond to the measures that are taken the UK has a very different policy or, or uh, in terms of things like face masks and in terms of social distancing than Vienna does, which is where I, where I spend much of my time. Um, so there's all kinds of, you know, I mean, of course, travel, br again, brings these kind of things to light, but certainly with COVID, um, I think it, it, uh, it encouraged, it, 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 you know, illness is an interesting word because, as I say, different cultures have different ways of practicing, and from one from one culture to the other, it can appear as though certain modes of behavior and certain modes of comportment are um, misjudged. You know, let's say so. Um, I think there's a whole host of of, of acclimatizations that are going on here that are definitely exerting stress upon individuals and upon groups. Yeah. Uh, professor, uh, what do you mean when you say maladjusted? Uh, so just a feeling of discomfort, a feeling of being out of place. You can say a feeling of being out of place within one's body and also a feeling of being um, uncomfortable in the company of other people, especially when there's a you know large density of people in a, in a compressed space, not such as an aeroplane. Um, you know, so feeling uncomfortable with that and how different populations and how different cultures deal with things like face masks, which is, of course, face masks have become politically and sociologically like kind of very a divisive, um, a, a divisive thing, a divisive issue. Thank you. Uh, então, o, o professor apresenta que sim, a gente pode pensar nessa, nessa perspectiva em relação ao corpo e que há formas diferentes de a gente pensar essa situação, mas, por exemplo, ele ele coloca que recentemente, né, hoje, inclusive, de ontem para hoje, né, ele fez uma viagem para poder visitar a sua família, é, mais de um ano depois, né, de estar afastado da família em decorrência da Covid, e que durante essa mesma viagem, ele pôde perceber ali diferentes é, experiências em relação a, a que foi proposto pela pergunta, como, por exemplo, o sentimento de maladjusted que o professor menciona é de estar desconfortável, fora do conforto, né, na presença de outras pessoas, como se estivesse deslocado. E essa questão, é, muitas vezes, é, aparece não só na companhia de muitas pessoas, às vezes não na companhia de muitas pessoas, mas ele consegue perceber pelas próprias práticas culturais, né, as diferentes práticas culturais que correspondem a esse tempo da Covid, né. Então, esse, ele responde diretamente a pergunta como essa expressão de um sentimento de estar desajustado em relação ao que tem acontecido, né? As angústias são muitas, 
desde a viagem ao trajeto que se faz, a visitar a família depois de tanto tempo afastado em decorrência da própria, do próprio tempo que estamos vivendo. Né? Antônio? É, Felipe, o, o andar da hora, a gente vai precisar encerrar né, a, a palestra. Uh, professor, uh, we have more questions, a lot of questions, uh, but uh, because I appreciate the sound, the noise. The, uh -huh. egg, the egg car <laughs> uh, in Brazil. Uh, uh, because we appreciate uh, your lecture and sympathy, uh, but need to close the lecture. Uh, uh, would you like uh, to say something uh, more? Uh, well, no, just to thank you once again for your hospitality and for uh, these very rich questions, which are certainly uh, very provocative and give me a lot, lot to think, of, think about. So I really, uh, just to express my appreciation again. Uh, professor, uh, I need to say that uh, it was awesome for everyone. We can be sure of this. During the conference, we had around 100 people watching us on YouTube. It was from 90 to 100 people, many questions in the chat, as Antonio has said. And it was a big pleasure for us receiving you in our seminar. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's very gratifying to know. And uh, thank you again for your kindness and your uh, hospitality. Very much appreciate it. I look forward to uh, hearing other talks in, in, in the conference. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, sir. Again, okay. uh, the pleasure uh, listening to you. Uh, and thank you uh, for the lecture, for the help of us. Um, thank everybody for the presence. Obrigado a todos pela presença. É, o evento vai continuar com a apresentação de artes. Ok. Thank you. Thank you, I'll leave now. Thank you. Bye bye. Boa tarde. No relevo dos afetos, a geografia humanista cultural é esse lugar sem fronteiras no entrecruzamento das humanidades. Na abertura a seu fora, ou seja, aquilo que não é geografia, mas que a atravessa e a constitui, a geografia com arte e a geografia da arte busca o que a arte nos dá a pensar a geografia ou mesmo que é pela arte que se pode dizer geografia. Todavia, a mostra de arte não é uma ilustração desses movimentos. Trata-se de lançar-se para fora em um devir artista de cada um, um devir geográfico da arte. Quando um tornar-se artista é necessário para expressar o mundo que nós somos. A galeria está no ar até o dia 22 de outubro. O link está na descrição do vídeo. Entrem com vagar, atentem aos caminhos virtuais que conduzem a cada exposição. Observem as instruções técnicas não sensíveis para apreciar cada obra. Elizabeth Reis, Stephanie Maldonado, Valéria Morim e eu, Ivo Venerotti, enquanto curadores, queremos dar as boas-vindas à Mostra de Arte do 11º Seminário Nacional sobre Geografia e Fenomenologia. É com grande satisfação que convidamos a todas e a todos 
a participarem da Mostra de Artes do 11º Seminário Nacional sobre Geografia Humanista e Fenomenologia, 11º Segum, que excepcionalmente esse ano, em função da pandemia, será realizado no formato virtual. A Mostra de Artes do Segum está em sua quarta edição e, assim como em suas versões anteriores, se propõe a ser um lugar onde a arte seja a principal forma de expressão de nossa relação com o mundo, nossa geograficidade, seja através das poéticas visuais, poéticas cênicas, poéticas musicais, poéticas literárias ou poéticas transmídias. Em função do tempo reduzido e dos desafios impostos pelo ambiente virtual, essa mostra, exibida no formato de uma galeria expandida, recebeu propostas apenas dos membros da Rede GUM, ou seja, do GUM e dos seus grupos associados. Sintam-se todos convidados, apreciem, que seja mais um momento fértil, criativo e de ampliação das nossas próprias maneiras de ver e perceber o mundo. Bem-vindos!